The subject matter for this evening is actually a very simple one. This isn't um, necessarily designed to teach you some brand new truth that you've never heard before or give you some extra special nugget out of the Bible that you haven't seen before, but it's a necessary uh, subject. It's something that we all need to hear from time to time. And what I want you to do just for a minute is just, just take a minute and think of your life and what your life was like before you called on Jesus for salvation and then we're going to think about what does salvation mean because you think about the way that you used to live and what I'm, what, where I'm gathering from I want you to look down here in Ephesians chapter 2 look at verse number 1 it says and you hath he quickened Quicken there means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. This is who you were before you got saved, right? Before you called on, an, on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You were dead in trespasses and sins, and you hath he quickened, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. Just like everyone else in the world, you were going through life, Living life, there's a worldly life, right? Your focus was on things of the world, making money, having fun, whatever, right? That was, that was your life. It's according to the, but then it says this. It says, we're in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's not a good lifestyle. That's, that's, it's a life that's, that's, directed by Satan, by the prince of the power of the air, the children of disobedience. Verse number three, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. There's a big distinction being drawn here between the life that you lived prior to calling on Christ as your Savior and the life that you ought to live after the fact. Now, I preached an entire sermon last week about the assurance of salvation and things like that. I don't want to get caught up into all of that. We know what the Bible says about being saved. We don't believe in this, this nonsense that you have to show all of your works in order to prove that you're saved. We don't, we don't believe that, you know, in this fruit inspection of like just looking, oh, you're doing this sin or that sin, that means you're not saved. That's not what we're talking about at all. But the Bible is very clear of how we ought to live our lives and we ought to realize and recognize everything that we've been saved from. And if that means anything to you at all, how you ought to live going forward and how you ought not to be like you were prior to your realization of being lost, of being damned, of, of deserving an entire eternity of hell. So the reason why I'm asking you to think about the way that you were before you were saved, think about the things that you did. I'm not talking about getting graphic or detailed necessarily, but just think about some of the things that you've done that you're not proud of, that you're ashamed of, and think about you know, what God's punishment really is for those things to bring you, maybe to bring you low a little bit and realize, I really wasn't that good. And, and, and look, we've all realized this the moment we got saved. You have to. You have to realize that I'm really not good enough to make it to heaven. I'm really not a good person. I really am a sinner. I really do deserve these punishments. And in some way, shape, or form, you need to under, have that understanding that you're guilty before God and that there's a punishment that, that you are due before you accept the payment that's made for you. But God, verse 4, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. And then, of course, we have the, the great verses in verses 8 and 9. For by grace you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, as any 
any man should boast. But then verse 10 follows all of that great teaching on, on salvation being completely free with, for we are as workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Think about the expectation that God has for your life. Think about where you were when God saved you. You didn't deserve God's love and mercy. You were, you were walking contrary to the Lord. But he gave it to you anyways. He gave it to me for free and with love. Wanting us to be reconciled unto him gave us that free gift. But after we've received that, what should we do with that? If you value, truly value your salvation at all, that eternal life, that gift, that love that God showed unto you, we ought to show respect back unto God and show our gratitude, our undying gratitude for doing all the things he didn't have to do. For doing the things that he did out of love for us because he wants us to be with us because he still loved us even though we were sinful, even though we've done so many things that would make us children of wrath. And the reason why I want us think about that, the, the title of my sermon today is Let the Old Things Pass Away. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. What I want you to do is start comparing your life now to your previous, I call it your previous life, the life before you got saved. And think about the things that you do different now. Hopefully there's a lot of things you do different. I know the people in this room, there's things that you do different now because we have soul winners in this room. We have people who go out and preach the gospel, which I know you weren't doing that before you got saved. And I'm sure there's many areas of your life that you've done a very good job of cleaning up. But what we want to do is be able to continue to go back and say, where else? What, what have I missed? What, a, what part of the old man is still around, is still kind of lingering around, and I haven't let that just die off? And I've just kind of kept carried this around with me even though I'm saved, even though I've got the new man, even though I've got the spirit and I want to serve God, what kind of things have I just let and just kind of clung to and didn't let just die off and let pass away? We need to be very careful not to, to revel in our past, maybe in some sinful days or wicked days or things that you used to do. It, it's, it's, it's not good for you. It's going to bring you back. It's going to draw you back into that flesh that you had. Unfortunately, a lot of people keep things. And, and one of the reasons why I'm even preaching is I went through some stuff. I was kind of clearing out some boxes in my, in my uh, office. And I'm, I kind of like, uh, you know, um, memorabilia. I kinda, there, there, there's things that I keep that are, that are just, you know, sometimes people give cards or whatever. There's things that, that I like to just keep around because I'm a, the word I'm looking for is sentimental. I'm kind of a sentimental type of person. You know, I, like, I like looking back and reminiscing on things and looking at things. But one of the things I found, I didn't even realize I had this because uh, when I got married, there's a bunch of stuff that I, that I got rid of. And I think that anyone, everyone that gets married, if you have anything left over from like previous girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever you had, that you need to just dump all that stuff like probably even before you get married, but you know, definitely when you're married to someone and you've tied a knot, I mean, you have no business holding on to stuff that, that you've you know, shared notes or conversations or whatever, these cards with people that you had in the past that, that you, know, you had a romantic interest in because you don't need to go back later then and start thinking about on those things because it's not going to do you any good. Now, that's obviously a point after marriage, right? And what we're focused on tonight is your, your, your point after being saved. But it's for the same purpose. 
right? Your point after marriage, why do you not want to look at that stuff? Because there's no reason to think about anybody else but your own spouse at all. And that's wickedness to go back and just go and think about times that you had with other people. It's wicked. And that's going to lead to more problems and it's going to be a curse in your life when you go back and start thinking about other boyfriends, other girlfriends, other people that you knew and, and, and thinking back on these things. You know what? Toss it in the trash. Let that die off. That all needs to pass away. All the, the old memories and the pictures, of, you know, get rid of that junk. You don't need it. You don't need to be thinking about it. You don't need your, your heart being drawn away from your wife. That's the last thing you need in your marriage. Similarly, we don't need to be drawn away from the Savior because of our, our flesh and the lusts of our flesh drawing us into sin after we get saved. Don't revel in the things that you used to do. Now, you may need to, to clean house in order to get your heart right. And, and I would suggest this and consider this. You know, what, wherever your problem may be, because it's real easy now to find people on, you know, on Facebook, on social media, and to just look up, oh, I wonder how, how my ex is doing. You know, you start thinking about these things. Again, the married people, you go back and you start thinking about, oh, I'm going to go look them up here and look them up there. Look, it's way better just to delete the stupid Facebook altogether and to just, you know, if you think you have any issue with that at all, just get rid of it altogether. Chop it off. Be done with it. If, uh, you know, your yearbook or whatever, you know, whatever is going to be going to be giving you the potential to get back into some type of sin, whether it be the, this looking at other people or even just allowing trash in your house. Maybe, maybe you used to be, you know, really big into watching a bunch of Hollywood junk that blasphemes Christ and that's filthy and that is just completely ungodly and you used to watch it and enjoy and get your entertainment from it. Maybe you've gotten past that, but you still haven't completely, you, know, you still have some issues with allowing things in your house. Hey, get rid of the TV. Get rid of the source. Cut it right off. Turn off your internet if you have to. Rip out the stereo from your car. Wherever your source of, of, of problems where you still have this, this, this element of your flesh that, that hasn't passed away yet, wherever the weak spot is, that's still kind of plaguing you. It's still carrying around. Hey, you may have to take a drastic measure to just make sure I'm going to mortify that part. I'm going to get rid of that. Second Corinthians chapter five, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It makes perfect sense. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself completely for you so why should we, you know, the life that we have, the new life that we have is, is only thanks to what he did for us. It makes sense that we should be forever indebted to the sacrifice that was made for us to pay for the debt that we deserve to pay. But he paid it for us. We ought to be willing to henceforth, from this day forward, be able to Live unto him and not to ourselves, not just worried about what do I want to do? What's going to feel good for me? What, how is everything going to work out great for me? Well, no, why don't we start thinking about our Savior? How is everything going to work out great for him and what he wants for me to do? He saved me for a reason. Maybe I should start thinking about the reason why he wanted me to be saved and what I can do to help other people out and to get them saved and, and ultimately just further the goal of, of what God saved you for in the first place. Verse 16, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Old things are passed away. The old life, the old ways of the world life that you, that you lived, those need to be passed away. The flesh needs to pass away and all things become new because you have a new creature. You have the new man. You have the spirit. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3.
Colossians chapter 3. As I was just mentioning, you may, if you're having a hard time letting the old things pass away, because here there, there's, a, there's a couple ways to approach it. One is by just focusing on the new man, you'll naturally allow other things to pass away. When you, when you change your focus on things that you used to do to new things, to things that you didn't do before, like reading your Bible, like praying, like so, you know, and you start occupying your time with the right things and you're focused on those things, naturally, the other things will start to pass away. They'll start to be left by the wayside. They'll go away because your interest and your focus is in the right place. But sometimes you need to take the approach where maybe you're not occupying your time, maybe you're not focused well enough on the good things to completely occupy all of your time and there's some things that may plague you where you just have to actually go through and mortify that and cut it off and be done with it while you're continuing to focus on the right things look at Colossians 3 verse number 1 the Bible says if you then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God if you're born again this is what we ought to be doing seeking the things that God wants us to do seeking after what God would have us to do with our lives Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. There's such a dichotomy, there's such a difference there between the things that just happen in this earth and being of this earth and being earthly and sensual and devilish and things that are of God. They're two opposing things. And we used to be of this world. We used to be, you know, walking in the ways of the world under the, the power of the prince of the air. But now, as a, a born-again believer, we need to set our sights on things above, our affection, the things that we like, the things that we want to do. That's what affection is. It's, it's, it's what do you really like, what, what means a lot to you. I think about the way that I used to be. My affection was on mind-altering substances like alcohol or other drugs. My affections were on you know, the, the, the entertainment of this world. That's what I like. That's what I wanted to spend my time with and doing and this, these types of things. Those are worldly affections, worldly lusts. But after you get saved, you need to change your affections. Now your spirit, the new man, will want the right affections. But we still have the flesh that wants the bad affections, that wants the sinful affections, which is why it becomes an issue, which is why I'm preaching this tonight, because we have both. We need to make sure that our affections are going the right way, that we are not only just coming and see. Unfortunately, too many people have a problem with this, too. They get saved, but they don't want to come to church. They don't want to read. You know, they don't want to do anything for God. And their affections are in the wrong place. And, and part of that goes to, and, and you know, because, I mean, people who are believers, I believe, are, are well-intentioned overall, and they haven't thought it all the way through because they're only thinking about themselves. This is why I wanted to go through the exercise at the beginning of just thinking, what were you like before? Where, were you, where was your eternal destination going to be? Do you realize how bad the things were that you did in God's sight were? And, and how merciful he was to you and how loving to give you just a free gift to, to be saved and, and to not have to face the punishment you actually rightfully deserve? And then after thinking and pondering on all of that, can you really still with a clear conscience say, yeah, but I still want to keep sinning and just keep adding sin upon sin even though God did that for me I just want to keep on going that direction what a wicked heart because I don't want to change my affections I still like these things and just want to keep walking in that flesh now look if somebody does that you have that choice but I'll tell you what your life is going to be miserable your life's going to be miserable. You're born again and you're living a life like that. You better, you better get prepared for some whooping. 
Because God, the Bible says that the Lord, that God scourges every son whom he receives. And that, you know, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You don't get away with things when you're born again. And if you're getting away with everything, you might want to check your salvation because that's what the Bible says is that then you're bastards, not sons. The wicked have a tendency to get away with things. The unsaved, wicked people that could just do whatever they want. They have all this money and fame and, and luxury and everything else. They seem like they could live their life and get away with everything. But they don't get away with it because they burn in hell. But the born again believer, the child of God, you don't get away with it. You may not ever have to spend a, a, a millisecond in hell. But if you're a child of God, he, he, God loves you and he's going he's gonna to discipline you. And you know what that's going to do to your life here? It's going to make it miserable. No, one wants to, no one's going to enjoy the chastening of God. We need to set our affections on things above for our own good. And honestly, you know, whatever your affections go, it's because you want to feel good overall. Whether it's something sinful or not, that's usually why you have your affection set on anything. But you have to realize when you're born again that the sinful things are not going to bring you what you're looking for. They're not going to bring you the peace. They're not going to bring you the happiness. They're not going to bring anything good into your life as a child of God because you're going to be disciplined for it. And because as a believer, you've got the new man inside of you that's going to be telling you, don't do this. Don't do this. This isn't going to be fun anymore. You know, I don't want to do this. You didn't have that before you were saved. What people call conviction. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Verse number three. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Mortify means to put to death, kill, destroy. Mortify your members upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. All of these things need to be killed. They need to be destroyed. If you have stuff like this in your heart, you need to do whatever it is you need to do to chop it off. You've got this covetous attitude and you're coveting after other people and you're coveting after relationships you've had in the past. Hey, cut it off. Mortify it. Kill it. And whatever the best way to do that is, whatever means that is, I mean, who cares if you never get on stinking Facebook again? Who cares? What are you really missing anyways? Who cares? If, I mean, even if you can't get on the internet again, what really, at, at, at the end of the day, what are you really missing out on? Overall, I know there's good things out there, but if that's what you need to do to mortify some members of your flesh, then pull the trigger. And if you can't do, if you're plagued with a problem, if you're plagued, you know, maybe, maybe someone's plagued with a sin of like looking at pornography or something. And if you're not willing to just cut off all the internet from you, then your affections are on the wrong place. And I'll tell you what, believer, you're going to be chastened by the Lord. You might as well just, just say, I don't need the internet or anything. I'm going to mortify the members which are upon the earth. Verse number six, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of Israel. He's reminding us, hey, don't forget. Don't forget that these things that I'm telling you to mortify, this is why God's wrath is going to be poured out on the children of disobedience. Those that are not saved, they're going to be experiencing all of God's wrath for these things that you're doing. Keep that in mind. That God's judgment and punishment for these sins that you feel so flippant about go ahead and doing because you think it makes you feel good. They're very serious. In the which time ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, 
blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. There's one. There's one that I think it's, gets overlooked a little too often. Why? Because it's so easy to do. Especially in certain environments, in certain settings, around certain people, allowing filthy communication. You ought to be ashamed if you, you, you're talking and you have just filth coming out of your mouth. It's a work of the flesh. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is a bond of perfectness. So he's, he's making the contrast between, hey, the unbeliever, they've got the wrath of God in them because of all of these wicked sins. You ought not to be doing the same thing because of how, how fierce God's wrath is and how, how uh, terrible they are, on the contrary wise, we ought to be forgiving as Christ was towards us. We ought to have the attitude that he has and have that type of a, of a spirit being humble, having mercy, showing kindness, being long-suffering with people. That is how we walk in the new man. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter sermon tonight, but turn to Hebrews chapter 11. One of the, um, well, another thing you need to, to be looking out for once you're out of the world. Maybe, maybe you've been very successful after you got saved of getting a lot of sin out of your life and you feel like, you know what, I'm not really worldly anymore. And praise God for that. I hope, I hope everyone can say that, that you know, I've, I've gotten pretty far away and, and I'm doing all right. You know, obviously no one's perfect, but I feel pretty good about, about the, you know, being out of the world. Well, once you're out of the world, you know, every man needs to take heed lest he fall. We all need to take heed to ourselves because you're never, ever going to be above the possibility of falling back into sin, of backsliding, as long as we're in this flesh. Because this flesh is still going to try to drive you to sin. So we can't allow the lusts of the world to deceive you again. You know, the, the things that I've gotten victory over, the things that, that I have been able to, to get out of my life, it's a lot more clear afterwards to see how deceptive those sins were, like the sin of alcohol. When you're in it, you're fuzzy, it's cloudy. You, you don't quite see all, quite how bad it really is. Now, there's always the hangover. There's always things that go along with it that aren't good. There's a, the shame that goes along with saying stupid things, of uttering perverse things out of your mouth, looking on strange women, like all the things that Proverbs 23 talks about. But once you get past that stuff, you are certainly like, wow, there's so, many, there's so many reasons why that's foolish. There's so many reasons that... that, it, that uh, the negative consequences that are associated with that, that I didn't even realize all of these things. You may have been experiencing a lot of them, but you weren't really pinning it to the source as you ought to have been. Once you get away from it, while you see, wow, that really is wicked and sinful. I get it now. And, you know, that's a great uh, understanding to come to because that'll help you to stay away from it. Similarly, you know, you're, you're watching TV all the time. You're watching these movies. You're just, just inundating yourself with, with the programming of the world. But then you get away from that for a while and then you look at it and you're like, wow, I can't believe I didn't see this before. I can't believe how wicked and sinful this stuff really is. You have to get away from that stuff for a while to really see the truth behind it because Satan's trying to deceive you with every sin. There's always the plug to, to, to get something out of it, to, to make the sin look attractive. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it at all. 
But let's say you get you get out of a lot of those things and you see those things don't first of all, don't get lifted up and proud and haughty thinking that, oh, I'm way above that. You know, stay humble and, and stay careful. And be careful not to let these old sinful thoughts or, or thoughts on old sins spend too much time up here. You can really do a lot of damage and start going backwards and you start thinking about, you know, if I were to start just overindulging and thinking about things, times I used to spend with friends, how getting, you know, doing this and doing that and, 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 and really just thinking on all these things, I might start to deceive myself into thinking, wow, that really was a lot of fun. Oh, that really was cool. And just totally forget everything I've already learned about, no, you need to stay away from it altogether because it's only going to ruin your life. It's only going to bring destruction. And any temporary pleasure that you get is only going to be for a season. And then it's not going to be anywhere close to the cost. That it's, it's not going to be anywhere close to worth the cost that you have to pay for getting involved in that junk. Hebrews 11, look at verse number 13. Because if you keep thinking on the old sins, you might just go back to them. Verse number 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. So what is this talking about? This is talking about people who claim to be pilgrims, right? They're strangers. Why? Because they're saved. Because now they're focused on their heavenly home. They're not focused on the things of the earth. And they're saying, you know, we declare plainly, hey, we're looking for another country. We're just passing through here. This isn't our home. We're thinking on things of heaven. He says, but... If they had been mindful of the country once they came out of, if they're mindful of the world, if they're just mindful of all the things of the world, they might have had opportunity to have returned. So these people that we're reading about in the faith chapter, how great their faith was and all these great things they did for the Lord because they had this faith, because they're focused on the things above. If they would have just been mindful about all the things of this world, they could have just gone right back into that. And we need to be careful because there isn't always an opportunity to return to the sinful life, to the sinful ways of just getting wrapped up into all the cares and pleasures of this world. Let's not be the failure that just falls back into the world. Let's be a man of faith. Let's be a woman of faith. Let's be a, a, a person of faith that can be mindful of, of that, or not to be mindful of the country we came out of, but to be setting our affections and our desire on the heavenly things, on the good things, on the things that the new man desires. Verse number 16, but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, so because of this reason, because these believers that have gotten saved, they received the free gift, because they decided to focus on what's right and focus on the things of God and choose to live their life that way. For that reason, God is not ashamed to be called their God. You know what that tells me? If you go back into the worldly things and back into the sinful things and just allowing your life to be overrun with sin, God's ashamed to be called your God. Now, he's still your God. He's still true to his word. He still keeps his promise. If he's given you eternal life, it's going to last forever. But you know what? I want God to say to me, when I get to heaven, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. Be thou over many things. I don't want him saying, glad you made it. And being ashamed of my life that I lived down here. Because I didn't care about the heavenly things. I just cared about the things of this world. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 11. It's the last place I'm going to have you turn tonight. As I mentioned, it's be a little bit shorter tonight. Numbers chapter 11. I think one of the causes, one of the things that happens to people that gets their focus 
diverted into the wrong areas and going back into the world is because they end up getting bitter with their new life. With that, you know, for, for whatever reason, because their heart, ultimately because their heart's not right. They know what the Bible says. They can't have fun in their sin anymore if they're saved. You got the Spirit of God inside of you. There's, there's a point to where you're just, it's just not going to be what it used to be. And people have these thoughts, though, still spinning in their head of, of wanting to go back to that, uh, to that life, even though it wasn't a good life. But you're, you're deceived and you think you want to go back to that and you end up becoming bitter with, oh, I don't want to serve God. Like, why do I have to go to church? Why do I have to dress this way? Why do I have to talk this way? Why do I, you know, and just becoming very bitter and not, um, not embracing the life that God has laid out that you ought to walk in. Because it's going to be good for you. Because God knows everything and God knows the path that is best for us to take and will bless us for making the right choices. We don't want to be bitter, but let's look at what happened here with the children of Israel. Because what happens here is God provides for his children. And in this story, they start just getting spoiled and, and sick of the path that God has them on. And they start becoming become bitter over the provision that God has given them in this life. And they want to go back into the world. They want to go back to Egypt. That's the story. And Egypt is a, is a picture, a representation of the world. They didn't have it good in Egypt. But once they get away from Egypt for a while, they start thinking on Egypt. They start, they start being bitter with what they have, not, not just being thankful for what God has given them, now they have to start thinking, you know, and you can apply this the same way with a wife. Now, instead of being thankful for the wife that God has given you and being thankful for that relationship and, and working at that and focusing on that, you know, people become bitter and thinking about other things that weren't better. But you build things up in your mind, especially the sinful thing. It's, it's another deceit. It's another illusion of, of something being better, the grass being greener over there. No, it's not. It's just going to cause you more problems. Let's read this story here in Numbers chapter 11. Look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. So what are they talking about here? Different foods, right? Luxury foods, all these extra spices and things that you could have. Oh, but the food was so good in Egypt. And look at, look at their attitude now here, verse number six. But now our soul is dried away. Our soul, can you be a little bit more dramatic? Our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all. Beside this manna before our eyes. God led them out of bondage, out of slavery, out of being treated poorly and being worked to the bone and freed them and delivered them and said, hey, you're going to go through a wilderness now for a while before you get to the promised land. It's going to get better. There is a promised land. In the meantime, this is what you need. And I'm going to provide that for you for free. You don't have to work for it. All you have to do is go out and pick it up. And I'm providing this for you. But the ungrateful people that had no appreciation for the deliverance that they had actually thought it would be a good idea to go back just for these, these lusts that they could consume these fleshly lusts and desires that they had. This is a perfect illustration of people who don't recognize the deliverance that God gave them by saving your souls from hell and then want to go back into whatever lusts that you have of your flesh that you were enjoying before you got saved. And just as foolish of a thought as this is, 
and not being content with where you're at and what God has given you, it's just as foolish when you're saved and thinking about these other things. But let's see how God deals with them because this is very important and it's, and it's something that you can't overlook. Because this attitude makes God very angry. It's kind of like in my house when my children want to complain about the food that's put in front of their face, the food that I had to, I had to work hard to, to provide for, to, to pay for my wife to go out and, and buy the food from a grocery store and then spend, her spend the time to make and to prepare and to put in front of, of their faces where they don't have to do anything. They just have to come to the table when they're called. And they don't appreciate that and they want to complain about that and they say, oh, I don't want this. You know, that doesn't go over very well in my house. And you could ask them about it. Not the right attitude. And if you think it doesn't go well in my, in my house, let's see, let's see how God feels about that type of an attitude. Verse number seven. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof is the color of delium. It just describes what manna is. Verse number eight. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. So they did a lot of stuff to prepare. I mean, they prepared it different ways. They didn't just eat it raw off of the, you know, off the grass or wherever they were collecting it from. They, they prepared it. They made cakes out of it. They baked it. They beat it. They ground it. You know, they did all kinds of different things, right? It makes sense. Look at verse number 10. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth a sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. This attitude that these people had of not being satisfied with what they were given and wanting to have flesh to eat, and we want this and we want that, it caused Moses to want to kill himself. That's how bad it is. And kids, when you complain about the food all the time and you're not thankful for what you have, it might make your parents want to kill themselves. It's not a good feeling. The parent doesn't want to hear that. Moses felt at his wit's end. He didn't know what to do. Because when people just complain and complain and complain, what, what else can you do? I mean, he can't even give them something to shut up so they'd stop complaining. He just has to hear this all the time. And you know what? That drains on a person. Just hearing nagging and complaining all the time and people who are not content. That is a serious burden to bear. Moses isn't kidding here. He's like, God, this is too much for me. Help me out. Otherwise, if you're not going to help me out, just kill me because I can't do this. I can't take it all, all the complaining. But you know what? It, it, it didn't just make Moses angry. It made God angry too. Let's keep reading. Verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them under the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. So God hears Moses and he's actually going to give him more people to help him out with, with dealing with the children of Israel. Verse number 17, And I will come down and talk with thee there and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee and will put it upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. 
Therefore the Lord will give you flesh and ye shall eat. And I love this next part because God's saying, okay, you know what? I heard you. I heard you complaining. I heard how much better it was in Egypt before I delivered you from slavery. And you just want to have that flesh to eat. So, okay, guess what? God's going to give you flesh. The Lord is going to provide for you. Verse number 19, you shall not eat one day. No, I'm not just going to give you flesh. No, I'm the Lord. I'm not just going to give you one day, just that little bit of taste so you can, you can have that, that taste back in your mouth for one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither 10 days, nor 20 days, but even a whole month until it come out at your nostrils and it be loathsome unto you because they have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him saying, why came we forth out of Egypt? This is how God does it. Oh, okay, you're gonna complain about the food I gave you? Yeah, I'll give you some flesh to eat. I'm gonna give you so much flesh to eat that you're gonna hate it and despise it and never wanna eat it again. It's coming out of your nose. That's how he deals with that situation. It is, and you could read the rest of the story in the chapter and and, you know, people end up dying for this stuff because they're not thankful to the Lord and they're not content with the things that God has given them. And we need to be mindful of where we came from. We need to be mindful that we don't go back, don't go backwards into that life and let's keep our mind focused forward. Because just because you're saved doesn't mean you're automatically just living a righteous life. It doesn't happen like that. You need to work at it. You need to stay focused on it. You need to keep your affections on the things which are above. And if you're having a hard time with that, work at it. If you could say today, be like, you know what? I really just don't enjoy reading my Bible. I really don't enjoy coming to church. I don't enjoy singing. I don't enjoy any of this stuff. You need to work at that. Because that is a heart problem. And you need to decide for yourself how important God is to you. And it's worth going back and thinking, if, if that is your heart, it's worth going back and thinking on the things that you've done and maybe taking some time to read on the judgment of God. Read about the verse. Read, go ahead and read Luke 16. Go read Revelation 20 and 21. Read Read the chapters where God is describing hell and think about that and think about what you deserve and what God deserves. What do you owe to God? How much is your soul worth to you? Do you value it? Do you value your eternal life? Or do you just want to trash it? When you start there, you start more, you know, to the root, closer to the root of your problem. I guarantee when you start getting those questions answered for yourself, as a believer, you'll start to, and then start working at the things you know you're supposed to be doing and spending more time with that, you'll, you'll, the, the more, the farther you get away from, the, from the, the sinful life, it should become apparent to you. You should be able to recognize the difference and see and, and start to, to get more of an affection for the right things and less of an affection for the, for the old things. We need to be reminded of this from time to time. It, it happens. We need, we, you know, sometimes we get distracted. There's things that happen. Sometimes we get discontented with the thing, with where we're at in our life. And I, I've personally been challenged a lot lately with all kinds of different things going on. And I'm not saying I'm perfect in any way, but, um, but it really makes you think. And, and we need to keep the proper perspective on things. No matter what happens in this life, we need to keep the, 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 the focus on the heavenly things on God's will, on what, on what we should be doing and setting our affections on those things. And if, we, and if we lose some physical things in the process, who cares? It shouldn't even really be a concern or you know, a thought. Let's not get caught up in that. Let's 
Let's worry about what, what God wants us to do in, in doing right in His sight. And let, let, the, let the old things pass away. We don't need any more. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank You so much for saving our souls. Lord, for loving us enough to send Your Son to die on the cross for us and to go to hell for us and to be risen again for us. Dear Lord, we thank You for that sacrifice that was made. I just ask that you'd stir up our hearts, help us to maintain the right focus, help us to set the affection, our affections on the right things, dear Lord, and that we would take heed to ourselves not to um, be deceived back into the worldly things, but that you would help us to, to maintain a right focus and Lord, that we would be a, a success for you and that we can be children that you're not ashamed to be called our God. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.